get ready. This is the awkward part where we're waiting. <laughs> Here we go. Keep waiting. And we're almost there. All right, you guys. Hey, that was probably an awkward intro. I'm Casey. This is Coach Tom. Uh, we are Shot Science Basketball. This is Shot Science Overtime number 143. Uh, this is our mostly weekly live show that we do Sundays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, we just want to remind you guys that this is a longer video that we like to do to address kind of your guys' questions. This is not a regular Shot Science video tutorial. So if that's what you're looking for, go check those out in our uh, YouTube library where we have several hundred videos for you guys to check out in terms of uh, developing your basketball skills and stuff. Uh, this is so that we can answer questions for people that might have them and also to cover a topic that we think is going to be helpful for you guys to help develop your skills, maybe help you take it to the next level and, and just become a better basketball <laughs> player. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a intro or kind of an intro topic that we talk about. And while we're, we're talking about that thing, you guys are going to be sending us your questions in the chat here. And we are going to, uh, as soon as we finish with the, the topic, we're going to get into answering your guys' questions. So usually it's the people that get their questions in early that get their questions answered. Right. So uh, make sure that you're sending those to us. Make sure you're following us on all our social media stuff. Uh, because you know we're there every day and we're doing different stuff in different places and hopefully cool things that you guys really like, all based around basketball and getting better and, and finding motivation. So uh, we are shot science on everything, whether that's Facebook, Google+, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, you name it, we are uh, shot science. So make sure you're checking us out on all that stuff and join the team and be a part of all this. Um, Let's see. So uh, our topic for today is, and you guys send us your questions while we're talking about this, is uh, is winning or skill development more important uh, for youth sports or kind of younger people uh, that are working on their game? Um, so what are your what are your thoughts kind of on that? Well, you know, there's been a lot of uh, information. Uh, on the media or in the media and on the online the last few months about uh, the importance of developing youth sports around uh, skill development. And, you know, I was reading an article today about uh, written by, or actually it was a, a video by Stan Van Gundy where he was talking about uh, what he felt was a major holdback for the development of basketball in this country versus Europe. And that is that we spend more time in our youth programs in developing uh, uh, players all around the, the uh, issue of winning versus the development of skills. And, you know, and as a result, uh, his comment was this, is that European players are becoming way more skilled in the important aspects of basketball than uh, American students are. And he says that that is something that we need to get back to. And, and I kind of agree with that. I think that Oftentimes, we spend more time uh, as coaches, maybe, looking for players who are just really athletic and who can do a lot of uh, really fun things and dunking the ball and that sort of thing, uh, rather than teaching them how to shoot the ball, how to pass the ball, how to dribble the basketball. Right. And that the European, in fact, uh, from time to time, I have European students that I work with, and for the most part, they are able uh, to do a lot more uh, with the basketball, uh, with their dribbling skills, than I'm used to seeing in, uh, in American basketball players. So, and so I think that's a real important issue that is really uh, kind of coming to the fore, is that we need to spend more time as players and uh, as coaches working to develop players' skills. And the skills that we're talking about essentially are uh, ball handling, shooting, and and, and uh, um, the other element that stumped out of my brain as I'm trying to talk about it, but those are things that are really important that we don't do a very good job with in this country. And so uh, that's the we we well, well, I, I, hang on a second. At, at Shot Science, we really build our teaching around those elements of developing skills for everybody. <clears throat> we don't do very much work at all <clears throat> where we're talking about specific position uh, skills, like if you're a post player. 
Uh, we do spend time with some uh, with our players on some of those things, but we actually spend more time just developing the skills of of uh, dribbling and shooting and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's like taking it deeper into our like philosophy stuff. I think yeah. I think one of the things that <clears throat> people need to consider is the fact that there are different priorities when you are approaching uh, kind of youth sports and right. stuff. And you know when you're a kid. Uh, it's kind of hard for you to to kind of make those um, connections to like why are we playing in this? Why am I working uh, with this this basketball club team? Why am I doing this or that? Mm -hmm. And and sometimes you have to look at what the kind of directives of the teams and, and coaches and stuff that you're playing with are. Right. Um, a lot of times you're going to join these club teams, and these club teams are going to want to win. And yes. it kind of defeats the purpose almost of you participating on those club teams. And when you are a young person and you're trying to get your experience playing and, and working with these coaches that are kind of uh, um, maybe a little bit higher level than some that you might see at, at your school or something like that, and they have more experience coaching, um, you need to look out for yourself to a to a pretty large degree i mean you got to do kind of your due diligence when it's researching whether you should play for this team or this coach or whatever because there are a lot of teams where all they want to do is win and it's yeah. at the expense of time that you could spend working on your own skills exactly um and so you know you could go play for this this club team and maybe you play constantly it you know and you're on the floor the whole time but is it helping you develop your skills which are really what take you to the next level right. sure you are getting some good experience probably playing but have you been is that time that could be better spent developing your skills and then finding a balance of of getting the experience mm -hmm. because sometimes it's like people get into this cycle of just they'll, they'll be on these club teams and they're just they play every day and and they go to these tournaments but there's no uh, time that's spent addressing their skill development. Right. And and so you kind of don't progress as a player in terms of your skills, maybe in terms of your experience and maybe uh, your athleticism or things like that. But your skills don't really advance. That's really true. And, and, and sure, you win. Mm -hmm. But what does it matter? Because in the long run, uh, you know, it, it's not helping carry you to the next level of basketball. Well, that's right. And <clears throat> yeah, and from our experience or from my experience, what I have seen is that there are our, our club teams that uh, have maybe 10 players. Uh, they usually don't have too many more than uh, 8 to 10. And that the players who are kind of on the end of that roster don't get to play very much. Uh, and the, the whole program is centered around the first seven guys or so, and so anybody after that doesn't get to play that much. And I think that's important, too, to develop is to spend time. I remember, and Casey probably can attest to this, too, when we started a local program uh, uh, maybe 15 years ago, or maybe it's been longer than that. It's goal, more than that. About 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, it's still in, in, in uh, uh, existence in existence even today. But the whole essence there was we had great coaches. Uh, we had, uh, I think, about the third year that we did this, we had uh, eight teams, and every team had a varsity coach uh, that was coaching that team. And the essence was let's develop the skills and then and that everybody is going to play in a basketball game. It's not like we're going to just have the first seven. We're just going to go to win. If we want, we, we started every game with the idea that we wanted to win it, and we played that way. But uh, if it wasn't the end of the world, if we didn't, if we didn't win the game, as long as everybody got an opportunity to play equally, um, and we tried to do that as much as we could. And as a result of all the kids that we had, there was a period of time locally where. Um, those those kids that played at different schools all played at a very high level. Uh, at least in my opinion, they played at a high level because they had developed skills as a part of our program. And I think that's an important way to go. Yeah, and you know you have to look at at the you know the different types of, of organized basketball as well yeah. because when you go and play for your school teams, um, that's going to probably be a different situation because. Yeah. Typically, that's going to be set up so that the team wins. Yes. And, and you know, you're, the coach in that setting is probably going to play the players that are going to help win. And there might be a minimum amount of skill development going on. 
typically because the coach is more concerned with with how the team is performing, not so much how you are performing. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times you, you have to come into that situation as your fully formed package right. and and have spent the time on your skills. But when you talk about these traveling teams or AAU teams or club teams or youth league teams or whatever th- those might be, that is that is different. That's kind of like more your time, more your investment than it should be uh, about the the team winning. Yes. Um, and so, I think that the big takeaway for, for from our perspective is that when you are researching who to play for and what to spend your time doing, you need to find the coaches and the team that are more worried about helping. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, helping you become a better player. And that, that is something that they invest time in. Yeah. So when you go to practices, it's not like, oh, we're just going to work on plays um, or we're just going to work on scrimmaging. It's like you are actually, okay, we're going to have the, a, a section on, on working on free throw shooting. We're going to have a section on ball handling. We're going to have a section on uh, shooting off the dribble. We're going right. to have a section on shooting off the catch. Whatever it is, it's like the, the practices are kind of um, formed to help you develop as a player and get uh, experience going up against other players that are good and, and getting experience working with those coaches. It's not like, okay, we're going to Las Vegas on mm-hmm. July 3rd and uh, you guys are going to get uh, you know get these jerseys and we're going to play and we're going to try to win. Yeah. It's like, well that does that really help you? Yeah. It's like that, was there any attempt to make you a better player that can keep playing at different levels? It, it, I mean, you have to kind of look at that stuff. Yes, that's very true. And, and you know, when you do get into the, the high school and maybe even the college level, sure, is there is more of an effort to to win games uh, and uh, oftentimes what players, there usually is a rotation in a lot of high schools are, are the first eight guys are the ones who are going to play the predominant roles in those games and other guys are going to just kind of kind of fill in or maybe not. Um, and the one thing that you want to make sure that you're doing when you're getting involved in some kind of a, 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 a travel team or an AAU team is this. What are the coaches uh, pitching and how do you know what they're pitching? Well, you can ask people who've been there before or who are there now, and they can tell you, this is what we do. And then have mom and dad examine this and see if this is going to fit for you. Uh, yeah, get, I mean, get reviews, get yeah. testimonials. Uh, you can ask coaches or teams to, to give referrals. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's good to just go out and find uh, those yourself. Yeah. Because, I mean, you, you, you can't get unbiased when it's somebody that they're picking. Right. But you need to ask the questions about who... Uh, or, or how they're approaching uh, working with their players. Yeah. Are they working with players to help them get better, or is it about just winning? Yeah. And I think you have to look out for yourself because it's great to win, but you have to think about down the line. Was it worth your time, or could you have better spent it doing – uh, some of these other skill development things or going to a, a camp here or or working with some skill development coach there or whatever it is right look out for yourself because that's what that's what those settings are supposed to be about anyways yeah uh, you know um, and oftentimes uh, you'll find that uh, um, coaches take 10 or 12 guys on their team with the idea they know they're not going to play all of them yeah. Which I think is kind of a, a, a dishonest kind of approach uh, because if you – In club In club situations. situations. In club situations. Because what they really want to do is to fatten the bank account uh, at the expense of those guys who are not going to play very much. And you know who is most dis- uh, uh, disadvantaged or not um, – they are mm, – disappointed, let's say, in how it goes when they don't play very much, is that maybe they've put $2,000 into this t- uh, travel team account to be able to get there and, and uh, play and learn and get better, and then they don't get a chance to play. And so, therefore, they probably don't get better either. And so uh, you kind of have to really examine at the team. Now, certainly there are a lot of them around who don't do that who are really good guys, good coaches, and spend time doing that. Yeah. But make sure you investigate whether a guy or a girl team doesn't make any difference and find out what you can about them before you jump on board. Otherwise, you could have spent a whole bunch of money and not really get much out of it uh, uh, for your efforts. Right. And, and here's kind of like the last little tag on that, and then we'll get <laughs> right into your guys' questions. Okay. And that is, is that there are great coaches, there are great club teams, 
But there are also coaches that are in it for the money. Yes. That are in it to kind of become the uh, the clinger clingers on to the next great players. Right. Um, and you need to make sure that you are not there at their expense of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, they should be there to serve you, and you need to really look at how your skill development is going to be addressed. Right. Um, and you know, we're telling you guys this because we've seen the horror stories <laughs> and we've seen people get taken advantage. We've seen heartbroken people D- avoid that. Yeah. Just get in there and, and find the right situation for yourself. Yeah. And, and you really have to investigate that. Okay. okay. So we're going to, are we done with that? Final words on that? There we go. Uh, okay. So we've talked about similar things before. So if you guys want to go check those out in our other videos, go ahead. Um, but we're going to jump into answering your questions. Make sure that if you have a question, you send it to us here in the chat. If you could go out and tell your friends and family to come check out our, our live shows, that always helps because, uh, you know, the more people, the better. Um, and it helps us grow the team. Make sure you're following us on all our social media stuff. We are Shot Science on Facebook, Google+, Plus, Twitter, yeah. Instagram, Snapchat, all that. And there's different stuff going on there. But that's how you can get in touch with us outside of this weekly review. Right. Um, but uh, let's jump into some of these questions well, here. Well, remind people to identify where they come from. Oh, yeah. From. Yeah. So we usually ask people, and we might ask you again in, a, in a 15 or 20 minutes, but let us know where you guys are from in the chat. So if you know we're sitting here in California in, in the United States, uh, we want to know where you guys are from. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's jump into some of these questions here. Okay. Uh, exi- let's see. Javier Cody Board says... Recently, I was cut from the basketball team, and I started a little late in training for next year. Is is now to November enough time to get ready for next season? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You should stop and think that, yeah, that uh, November, the first of November, usually is the starting date for most high school teams, and and uh, that's another six or eight months, and so uh, that gives you plenty of time if you're willing to spend the time. See, this is one of the things that is really interesting to me is that I have this conversation almost daily with players that I can show you what to do and how to do it. But the burden of getting better is really on your shoulders. And what that means is that you have to get out and spend time doing all the things that we have worked on so that you get better there. And one of the things we're working on with some of our students today is this, is uh, they were a little bit more advanced students. And so what we were doing is we were working at game speed, utilizing a couple of counter moves in that game speed. And they had to come uh, uh, full court and then they had to execute one or two of these moves, these counter moves, and get to a point where they could shoot a jump shot. Not very effective in the beginning, but as they began to get going a little bit, then they got better and better and better. And so what you want to really do is uh, take, and there's a period of learning period that we call pillar number one, where we, we expect people to, we teach, they learn, they spend time getting better, and then finally when they're starting to feel pretty good, now it's time to speed up and go at game speed. And what that changes the program so much because when you practice at a practice slow pace, then it comes time for the game speed, you're going to screw up uh, and your skills are going to fail you. But if you practice at game speed and you go through a little bit of fatigue uh, as well, then you find that you get better and your, your moves and everything, your shooting begins to improve a lot more because you're playing now at the same speed that games are uh, played at. Well, here's the other thing too, is that you, you have this amount of time to do it. So you, you have to do it in that amount of time. I mean, uh, you know, for us to say, no, that's not enough time. I mean, that's, that's, that's not the truth. And this is, you have that time period from now to November to, to get whatever you can get done. So you might as well just do it. Um, you know, if we, if it's important to you, if we, that's what you want to do. I, I don't know what, the, you know, what you want to hear from us. If, if you, if we read that question, do you want us to say, well, nope, that's not enough time. Are you going to just pack it up? Because I don't think that's a good approach. I think that if, if you have that, that much time, which is, a, it's a good chunk of time that you can put in a lot of work between now and then. Yes. And so I would say, just go out there and do what you can do in that amount of time. Put everything into it with a good approach to practice. Like you were saying, uh, you know, the three pillars of practice is a good way to approach all that stuff. Yeah. Make sure that you are addressing uh, every aspect of basketball and not trying to become just a position player. Because if you do that, you're going to really limit yourself. 
You want to become an all-around versatile player that can step into any position um, because that can it, it only helps you if you're if you yeah. ultimately are assigned to be a point guard by the coach and you can also play uh, using some post moves uh, or if you're a post player uh, or you get assigned to the post by your coach and you can also step out to the perimeter uh, and kind of stretch the defense a little bit. I mean, all those things are great. So you want to make sure that you are a versatile player. Um, so, you know, the, the thing is, is that don't ask questions about, is that, is that enough time? Yeah. I mean, it's the time that you have, so you might as well take advantage of it. And, and then he also asked, uh, what should I do differently to get coach's attention next year? I'm a freshman, by the way. Well, that's a pretty clear uh, answer to that one, and that is you have de you develop your skills. We started this program off talking about how important the development of skills is at, at in becoming a really good basketball player, and so that's really what you want to do: improve your skills, and that's what's going to impress him. Now, we also, if you check out uh, our videos on YouTube, we have one. In fact, we have a couple of them that are uh, kind of this. They're addressing this issue: how to make the team. Yeah. OK, and we tell you in there the things that we think are really important for you to make the team. Uh, effort is really important. Skill development is really important. And in those skills, uh, being a pretty good shooter always helps. OK, yeah, and showing initiative and uh, being a leader, all yeah. those things will help. And, you know, in those videos, we talk about things that are very easy to um, kind of flip the switch on immediately. Um, it's more of a mental space you have to, to approach than it is a skill you have to develop over time. Yeah. I mean, sure, it takes a while to kind of, uh, you know, have that inside yourself to be a leader and things like that. But there are kind of cues that you can hit immediately that will help you get there. Right. Whereas it's if we said, well, you want to be a great shooter, uh, that'll get your coach's attention. Well, yeah, but that also takes a lot of time to become a great shooter. Yeah, Whereas if you are showing effort and you're the guy diving for the ball and you're you're running from from uh, you know uh, each drill to drill or whatever, that stuff also catches a coach a coach's attention right away right. because they want those guys to be on their team. Yeah, guys who play with great effort, but maybe a little less skill. You'd be surprised how many coaches want to select them for that reason. Yeah, I mean th those are the those are the guys that make coaching easier, and that's what coaches want. Um, okay, this one is from Marco Marco Rojas, who says, uh, "Hi, I got a game tomorrow. I'm five foot ten, uh, point guard. Uh, I want to score more. What do you recommend for me? Greetings from Costa Rica." Well, well, um, the thing I, I, it's pretty vague. That's that's one of those things. Like, yeah. you know. If we could tell people how to score more, I mean, uh, and it, just have it be a plain answer that we could give you in, in, a, in a sentence or two, then I think we would have the, the key to the city and all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that uh, we can't tell you how to score more because we don't really know you as a player. Yeah. And number two, uh, you know, it, it, it it's almost uh, like, you know, we always say you have to come into a basketball game prepared and and have the feeling that you've already been there before and so that kind of gets back to how we address practice and your own skill development which is through the three pillars of practice mm -hmm. where you have the first pil pillar where you're working on diligent uh kind of uh repetitive consistent uh f work on on just getting the the base foundation of form and technique and all that stuff down and then you have the second pillar which is more game speed game intensity of those skills so you're ramping it up to actually having a defender or visualizing the defense just doing it at the speed of a game and then the third pillar being experience uh, because if you have the experience applying those skills then when you get into a game it's like you've been there before and it's not like you have to uh, you know you know you panic because you've never done it you've been there before um, and you can get to that just through playing pickup games or playing club sports or playing for your school team or whatever but you've actually used those skills in a game setting. Right. And so that's how you really are going to be prepared to step into a game. It's not like we can say, oh, well, your game is tomorrow. Uh, do this. Yeah. Um, that's really, really hard. And it's not really the best approach. I think that you have to be prepared beforehand. But in the short term. Well, you know, one of the things that, that every player needs to, to kind of come to grips with is that everybody wants to score. I mean, that's the reality of, of this game is that everybody wants to score more, okay? And 
the thing that is most important is this. It's not about you so much it is as about your 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 team and that the team's goal is to uh, outscore the opponent so you win. I mean, that's the that's the upshot of it. If Casey and I are going to play against one another, uh, it's going to be who's going to score more than the other. That's that's the essence of it. If it wasn't, then it wouldn't be much of a game. It wouldn't be a contest. But the, the thing that's really important for you, too, is that you need to take advantages of opportunities that come your way. Uh, and sometimes we pass those up. Sometimes we are a little bit afraid to pull the trigger uh, when we could, and maybe we would score more than that. But the upshot of it is, I, I saw a game recently that was a championship game for, for the league, and uh, there was a, in the semis, this one player uh, scored 26. The guy was awesome. He was all over the floor. In the final game, he was defended a little better, but he only got four. But his team won anyway because he got a whole bunch done with rebounding. Uh, he played really good defense. And so sometimes the scoring is going to, uh, you're going to score really well. And sometimes you're not going to score as well. But the outcome of the game is really what is important for you and your team members. Did we win or did we lose? That's why we play. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would also think about more, um, you know, being relaxed, not forcing shots. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, they want to score. They want to take shots. They just want to take shots. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's not really a good approach. You want to take good shots. Good shots. You want to create space to get those good shots. Right. Uh, you want to always be doing something to really kind of create the opportunities. Um, if you're forcing shots, that doesn't make them quality. It doesn't make no. them go in. No. So, you know, I think that you have to have a good approach to the game where you are you're being, uh, you're setting yourself up for those good opportunities. Right. So if you're not used to moving without the ball, if you're not used to setting screens, if you're not used to, uh, you know, setting up your teammates to create opportunities for them, then you're probably not going to get all those opportunities to score. Right. Um, you know, uh, when you do those things, you end up with the ball in your hands more, and you also end up with situations where the defense is playing catch up to you, yeah. and you're going to find yourself with open layups and open shots. Yeah. So those are kind of the ways that you really will generate more opportunities to score, right. and also they will be good opportunities, good open shots right. for you to take. Okay, next question. This well, actually, let's let's see where some people are from. We got somebody. Hassan Abbasi is from Canada. Um, let's see. We have the Soldiers is from Kentucky. VKJ Productions is here from Canada, from Toronto. Um, let's see. And a bunch of people from the United States, I guess. Cool. Well, keep telling us where you guys are from. We always like to hear that yeah. stuff. Uh, like we said, we're sitting here in California, so it's cool to see people from all over the world. <laughs> Um, let's see. This one is from Momar Nyang, who says, what should I do to develop a great hook shot? <laughs> that <clears throat> shot's no different than any other. You, you spend time trying to perfect it so that it, it, the execution is good. And it's just like uh, if you were learning to shoot a free throw or set shot or whatever, uh, and then you're shooting a hook shot, the elements of the shot are really important first off. Yeah, the and foundational element. The foundation of the shot is so key. And once you kind of have that down, it comes down to this formula. Practice, and practice, and then practice some more. That's how you get better. Consistent, diligent practice using those three pillars of practice that we talked about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we would also send you to our video on, uh, you know, how to how to do the, the sky hook. And I think yeah. we also have one on the jump hook. Yeah, we do. Um, so I would say go check those out. And, and really pay attention to the, like we said, the foundational elements. Yeah. Because if you get those down, then you can start to <laughs> ramp up the speed and get it up to game speed. But if you're just trying to force uh, a, something that you've never done before to happen at game speed, that's a good way to not really be successful. Yeah, you probably won't, so yeah. slow everything way down. Yeah. Uh, seriously, to just like slow motion where you're taking those steps <laughs> and yeah, and really fitting all the pieces together and then start to build up the speed. Right. Okay, let's see. This one is from UAA11 who says, who do you think is the best shooter in the NBA? Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. After last night? Yeah. Well, that guy can shoot the ball from well, anywhere, who are, anywhere he who wants. Who are you talking about? We're talking about Stephen Curry. I mean, the guy can just shoot the ball, lights out. 
<clears throat> but it's not like he learned or uh, that he doesn't practice that every day. Yeah. Uh, the word around is that when uh, they have practice days, he goes to the practice early and he shoots a thousand shots. And many of them probably are threes, but he shoots a thousand shots before practice begins. Uh, that's all about repetition, repetition, repetition. Yeah, and, and, and he pro he progressed to the point where oh, he could yeah. do that stuff. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't like he just stepped out to thirty feet and started shooting. Right. He progressively worked on his form and and built up the muscle memory and progressively worked his way back to that. But you know, I mean, there's Stephen Curry, Clay Thompson's Clay Thompson, an incredible right. shooter. Yeah. Kyle Korver, even though you know this year is not his best year, but right. I mean, the guy is still an incredible shooter. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's a long list of like really great shooters. You know, but Steph Curry, he's operating kind of on a different level right now because you know not only is he an, a fantastic shooter, he's also got this confidence right now that is insane. You know, I mean, he steps up and he's pulling the trigger at thirty feet like it's, uh, you know, like if anybody else did that, the coach would probably you know lose his mind yeah. because it's that's not typical. And if you have the confidence and the skills lined up, I mean, you're you're gonna. Uh, you know, kind of find yourself where Steph Curry is, where things are just happening. Yeah, well, and, and a lot of that is really kind of interesting in how he sets players up, too. Uh, I caught just a very a short clips because I wasn't able to watch the game last night, little clips of him working against um, uh, the guard from uh, Westbrook. Oklahoma, Westbrook. And he had a little couple of shakes right and left, and you can just see that Westbrook is frozen. Uh, in, because he does, he's not sure what he's going to see, and then all of a sudden, uh, the ball is up and it's on its way. Well, that, that's that's one of the things that we always talk about is that you need to be the one that's in control. Oh, yeah. You need to make them react to you, whether it's on offense or defense. You know, you need to be the one that's that's forcing the action. So if you talk about somebody like Steph Curry or even Clay Thompson or most of the guys on the Warriors or anybody that's kind of uh, an effective higher level basketball player they are moving without the ball they are they're forcing the action they are not sitting back and waiting exactly. or reacting to the defense or reacting to the person that they're going up against because that's a great way to get yourself in a situation where you're playing catch up and that's when you're you're pretty much toast and yeah. Westbrook even though he has he is obviously a superior athlete uh, superior in in you know uh, reaction time and body size and all that stuff he he was in a situation where he was playing catch up to Steph the yeah. whole time yeah. because Steph was 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 putting him through the motion on stuff. Yeah, he and had he, to move. Yeah, yeah, and he was doing the he was doing all the cuts. He was setting screens. He was he was running through screens. I mean, it, it's it's a situation where you are you're in a tight spot when you're trying to catch up with one of those guys. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, this is from VKJ Productions, who says, do you recommend a two-motion shot uh, like Larry Bird or a one-motion jump shot like Stephen Curry? Uh, we, <laughs> that's kind of like a, somebody, there's people out there that are trying to make these these uh, kind of one or two-motion shot thing a thing. And it's yeah. not, it's, it, it's kind of the wrong approach to even think about. What you want to have is an efficient shot that eliminates all the unnecessary variables and is just one fluid, easily repeatable motion. Just like Curry's yeah, or, I mean, or Thompson's. I mean, they are smooth. They are quick. I mean, um, the thing about Larry Bird is that he essentially would get the ball to the set point before a lot of these other guys really do. Like the ball would just get to the set point, and so his, you know, it's already there as he's going up into the shot. Whereas somebody like Steph Curry, he's already down and going up into the shot as and everything is moving up in one fluid motion. But Larry Bird was essentially doing the same thing. Yeah, it, yeah. It's just that he was playing more upright. The ball was already in the set point as he was extending his legs. It wasn't like he was doing a one-two situation. I mean, that's that's people are applying too much, uh, you know, thought into that. When when you are talking about a a one motion or a two motion shot. For us, before any of this other stuff was a thing, that meant to us that you had a, a sticking point or a, a point where your power is drained between the shot motion. Exactly. So if you are not connecting your legs, uh, if there is a moment where you're just hanging in the air and everything has stopped, or if you, uh, you're just, you, it, there, there's no connectivity in your shot, 
then that is a two motion or three motion or four motion, whatever it is, where you are losing power. What you want to have is you want to have motion that is connected from your feet to your follow through and you are releasing the ball as you approach the top of your jump. Yeah. And everything else needs to be eliminated. Yeah. Eliminate the dipping, eliminate the hitches, eliminate the uh, you know hanging in the air. You want to have everything flow so that you conserve all of the power that you generated for your shot because a huge reason is because you want all the power to be generated from your lower body right. and have that be your power base, whereas you want your upper body to kind of be uh, how you dial in and, and accurately dial. finesse the ball to the basket. You don't want to be muscling with your upper body right. because that's going to mess up uh, your touch. And that's a usual uh, thing with a two-part shot is that you end up trying to muscle the ball with your arms. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of a it's it's a ridiculous thing. Larry Bird is not a two motion shooter. No. I mean, he he was getting the he had he was he had everything connected just as well, but it's it was just, you know, he got the ball to a set point and his set point was also kind of a strange over the shoulder up near the head situation as well. But the fact of the matter is is that he also had perfected that and and it's just that that's other people trying to apply stuff that it doesn't really follow through. Right. Um, okay, let's see. This one is from Hassan Abbasi again, who says, at the start of our basketball season, I didn't play that well. I know I'm good, but my coach doesn't play me that much. How can I show my coach that I can play more? Again. You know, it's hard for us to assess what is going on with you and your coach. Sometimes coaches uh, will start to, to use a player – uh, less because they're not really conforming themselves to what they're trying to do uh, uh, as a team. There's a whole bunch of reasons why he may not do that. Probably not because he doesn't think you can play. One of the things that you can do, and do to kind of help this situation, take a time out and talk with the coach. And when you talk to the coach, don't go and challenge him. You know, I need to be more, I'm better than that guy. I should play more. I, when you start taking, laying out those kinds of, of ideas or terms, then he's going to shut down and you probably play less than you play now. But if you go to him, you say, Coach, I, start, I played quite a bit in the beginning and I'm not really sure why I'm not playing as much uh, now. Can you kind of let me know what I need to work on so that I can get back and, and get a little bit more time on the floor? When you take that kind of approach, you're not threatening the coach. And so he probably will very honestly tell you what it is that the problem is. And so that's that's how we would recommend that you deal with that problem. We can't tell you uh, that you should do this or you should do that to get on the floor more. We don't know what your game is all about. We don't know what your coach is all about. But you both know each other. And so you need to take and come together and kind of chat a little bit uh, and find out where are you on his in his brain and uh, what do you need to do to get more time and i would say also you know go look at the video that we were talking about earlier the how to make the team video yeah. because those are those are ways that you can easily show your coach that you even want to be there yeah that's um, true that's you know true. a lot of times people think that just showing up is is good enough and it's right. not if you really want to catch a coach's attention be the guy that shows all the effort be the one that shows the initiative the leadership um, those are things that really catch coaches eyes yeah. and you can, and you know, if you're the, if you're pouting or have a bad attitude, that's a great way to not get more playing time. Yeah, so totally. go check out those videos and, and there's going to be information there that I think is probably going to help you. Yeah. Okay. Giddy Woody says, thank you guys for, a lot for your bids. I'm now a comfortable double digit score. Awesome. All right. All right. Um, and then they also ask, uh, what drills do you recommend for defense? Well, <clears throat> defense is, is a interesting situation. It's not necessarily exactly like how you would practice offensive skills, I wouldn't think. Um, I think the best thing, though, is that you need to really, again, work on the foundational elements of defense. Which, and, which basically are about how you use your feet. Yeah, it's, it comes down to footwork hugely. And so, you know, we would say go check out our Defense 101 video and we show you like all the, the, the breakdown of, of what you need to have. And that's a good athletic defensive stance. Um, it, we show you how to use your feet in terms of footwork and moving. So I think that you want to start at the very bottom, really work on getting that proper defensive stance first, and then start working on uh, adding in how you move while you're in that defense, defensive right. stance. Right. And that's going to be that step drag uh, work that we that we talk about and you know that's going to take a little bit 
um, of, of effort to really get that cemented into how you actually play when you get onto the floor because sure it's easy enough to say okay work on this and then and then how, do you apply that in the game because hopefully that's what you would be doing right. um, but you want to really work on that and then work on adding that in then add in the defensive player this would be the second pillar of practice or uh, the offensive player and have them kind of slowly go through the motions of of dribbling one way and then dribbling the other way and you just start to ramp up the speed on all that stuff and eventually you'll get to the point where you are uh, at game speed and you have to be able to to move laterally and move back and forth um, and and so you have to be a little bit creative and you know there there always are uh, drills that you can do like you know at basketball camps they'll have you do the diagonal slide drills mm -hmm. where you you slide two or three times and you you pivot and you slide another and you're doing the 45 degree turns that works um, but just really get the foundational elements in place and then progress up so that you keep those foundational elements as you work up to game speed two things that that i would think that would help you a whole bunch uh, in the way of footwork is this is that when you are doing your slides don't allow your feet to come together as they as as you're shuffling that's a really a major problem because what happens is then we become more erect on defense. In, in other words, we start to stand up more. But if you take and keep your feet apart, maybe a foot or so, uh, then you continue, to stay, uh, you continue to stay low. The other thing that's really important is this, and this is what we teach our guys, is that you want to keep that person between your knees. And that's kind of a tough thing to do. If they go to the left, then you have to slide hard left. And you have to be able to keep them between your knees. If you can, you can always stay in front of them. Yeah, I mean, that's about beating, beating them to the spot and making sure that, you know, they they are not going to be able to just step around you. And, and you know, that can really help neutralize somebody that is more athletic and faster and quicker than you are, is yeah. if you are constantly uh, anticipating and keeping yourself in the proper positioning to, to stop them from going by you. You know, another thought that's really important, too, is understanding that some players are quicker than you are probably, and they're probably going to beat you after a couple of steps or a couple of slides. And the thing that's important there is turn to run. And that means that you're going to pivot your, your uh, hips and you're going to run as hard as you can to relocate in a position in front of them if it's at all possible. So many times I see that a player will get by another player and they shuffle, shuffle, and then they just kind of relax and let them go. Uh, but uh, there's other defensive principles that come into uh, yeah, well, play I mean, there too. But, so, but that that all, that comes back to not being the reactionary force yeah. when it, when you're on offense or defense. Yeah. And you know, if you find yourself where you are beat then get your ba yourself back into a position where you are the one that's creating the, the, the action. And you have to do that by turning and sprinting to get in front of them. And, and that's an important thing to do. Yeah, I mean, if you're just going to be kind of content with sliding along and, and not getting yourself back into position, yeah. then that, that person is going to be in control they're the gonna, rest of the time. And so, beat you, yeah. so get yourself back uh, so that you are in control. Um, okay, this one is from the soldiers who says I'm like five foot ten and I'm pretty good at grabbing boards and playing defense. I really need to work on scoring. Okay, well uh, we would agree. I mean that's that one of the things that we always talk about is that you want to be uh, a very versatile, well-rounded player and be able to play every position and be able to perform every aspect of basketball. And uh, you need to address each aspect of basketball. Yeah. So that's good. I would say do it and make sure you're do consistently it. addressing everything else. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. This one is from Kyle Kennedy, who says, I had a bad trainer who messed up my footing on my jump shot. Uh, my feet aren't squared anymore. How can I fix this? Well, you're talking to the wrong people if you're talking about wanting to be squared up for your shooting. We don't agree with that either. Uh, we feel like you need to have a staggered step. Uh, and the reason for the staggered step is you can get yourself into better balance uh, when you're shooting uh, and better control of your body when you're shooting. When you are hopping into the shot, which, you know, that's kind of the other alternative, there's two things that happen. One of uh, which is this. If you hop into the shot, oftentimes you're off balance, okay? And so uh, that's going to take and affect the uh, outcome of your shot. 
The other thing is that that ends your dribble. And if you have all of a sudden the person is in front of you and you need to maybe use a counter move, you can't do it because you have hopped in the shot and ended your dribble. And so we don't agree with, with that. Well, here's the thing. Bringing it back to like squaring your feet up yeah. is that you have to remember or recognize that shooting a basketball is not a two-handed yeah. approach. And also your, your arm or your shooting arm is not growing out of the center of your body. Yeah. All right. So with that in mind, you have to kind of give a preference preferential treatment to that shooting side. So if you're squaring your feet up straight, you have to force your body into a contortion to get the ball lined up the way that it needs to be to get to the basket. Um, it, it's just, you know, that's the only way it is. I mean, you have to force that arm in and that's not going to be ergonomic. It's not going it, to, it's going to create more tension than it's not. And so all you have to do is it's a slight stagger. And you really are just kind of giving that slight turn so that you have your wrist, you have your elbow, your shoulder, your hip, your knee, your ankle, all in your shooting side are lined up right with the basket. So everything is in line. Um, you know, it's, it's, it just, it's going to make more sense for your body to do that. Yeah. Whereas if, you are, if you're doing it square, you'll probably find that if you watch people that actually do square their feet, is that in the air, their body is going to kind of get to the point where they are f favoring that side anyways. And that's not what you want either because that's a, a variable of movement that you're adding in as you're going up into your shooting mechanics. And that, that just makes your shot more, more complex and more hard to replicate. So you want to have that slight stagger before you even start into your mechanics. So you want to have it as your feet are setting so that your 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 non-shooting side foot is just slightly behind where your your shooting side foot is. And that's going to really kind of bring everything in line so that everything you your, is... You want your shooting shoulder forward anyway. Yeah. And so everything's in line. The ball is in line with all those points that we talked about. And so when you deliver it to the basket, everything is coming from that one orientation whereas if you're trying to do it from being squared up okay i'm forcing everything into the middle it's hard to line up yeah, like that is. so we don't we, we're not fans of, of the classic squaring up or anything all right let me let me go back here to kyle for just a second okay hurry uh one of your comments here or part of this comment was i had a bad trainer who messed up my footwork or my footing okay um Obviously, when you didn't agree uh, with, with what he was teaching you, maybe you should have called him to task and find out, well, why do you teach it this way? And let him have a chance to kind of explain to you his thinking because, you know, everybody that teaches uh, or as a trainer in most any sport, no matter what it is, has different ideas maybe than uh, this guy over here or that one over there or that one over there and there usually are pretty good reasons for it and have them explain to you it's not necessarily maybe the fact that he was a bad trainer maybe he just had differing opinions of what you needed to do in your footwork and you should discuss that rather than say he's a bad trainer uh, now there may be other things that you didn't agree with but my whole point point is this is if i have someone that begins to take on this this attitude of, uh, well, why would why do you really want to do this? Or I, I don't do it that way. Uh, then we part ways right away because obviously they don't want to know what we teach. And so understand that uh, you you can end that relationship if there's something there you don't like about what they're teaching you. You don't have to take and just absorb it all and then bad mouth them over it. Well, well, here I mean there are going to be bad trainers and there are going to be there good are. ones. There but are. Here, here's here's the thing is that you need to be your own best coach. Yep. You need yep. to listen to all of the inputs about uh, you know how, why people do things um, because if you know why things are being done and it makes logical sense, yep. then you need to do those things. Absolutely. If it doesn't make sense or it's done for no real reason or the reasoning doesn't really add up, yep. then don't do those things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes even the greatest coaches at the highest levels, they have weird, uh, you know, interpretations of, of what they think people should be doing. And if that doesn't make sense to you, then you don't need to do it. You don't need to do it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, 
hopefully our approach for telling you guys or conveying to you guys what we think is best is that we hopefully are are giving you the background of why and the science of why and and not just telling you okay well this you shoot like this yeah. well hopefully the the reasoning behind it is that we actually tell you why you shoot like that exactly so it, that so that it makes sense in your mind and that you can decipher uh problems that come down that come down you know the road or that you know you can you can be able to help teach yourself if something comes up whatever it may be that it, it just makes sense yeah okay so uh we're gonna do a lightning round here we're going to have shorter answers to your questions <laughs> so that we can get through more people. Okay. But again, tell us where you guys are from. Uh, you know, we're from here in California. We want to know where you guys are from. Uh, Hassan Abbasi says, uh, I'm from up north in Canada and it snows a lot. I want to learn how to score better, but I don't have access to an outdoor court because of the snow and there aren't much indoor courts around here. Do you have any drills to practice scoring at home? Okay. I mean, there's, there's a handful of things you can do. You can always work excuse me, on, on developing your mechanics and, and just working on that stuff by yourself, whether it's in front of a mirror or just standing in the middle of your house or in the garage or whatever it is and working on your release and making sure everything is all you know fine and dandy. But you do need to find a basket. And we always tell people that have this kind of issue, like I can't find a cord or, or I don't have time or whatever, we always tell them, you got to learn to figure it out. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a... a, a a harsh uh, approach to it but the fact of the matter is is that nobody can help you uh, other than yourself in those situations so if you have a hard time finding an indoor court to play on go find another indoor court or uh, maybe get together with some friends and maybe you can get some time playing at an open gym or something i don't know there's but, always a way yeah i mean but we can't tell you what those ways are because we're not from canada we're not used to the snow and all that but you can find a way. I mean, so, if I, oh, so, so many of these great players that are in the NBA right now, they had probably a lot less opportunity than you did, yeah. and they somehow figured it out. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be really resourceful and creative and make some phone calls or <laughs> ask the right people or whatever it is, yeah. and you will find some places to play. There, there will be a place for you. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's places to play in Canada. Um, and... Uh, you will be able to find those. So just do a little bit of legwork and you'll be good. Okay, lightning round. Uh, we had somebody see. there from Germany. We have Isaac Q from Idaho. We have Mr. Bosco 52 from Germany. Uh, Mr. Bosco 52 asks, who do you think are the three best basketball players at the moment? Uh, I it's, mean, it's hard to tell. That's that's really hard. I mean, there's a, there's a handful of really great players right now. Uh, let's see. Isaac Q asks, how to shoot a three-pointer? smiley face well i mean we have a ton of videos on our on our channel that talk about that but you have to start using the form shooting drill starting close and then work progressively back and then you have to apply the second pillar of practice which is game speed game intensity and then the third pillar which is game experience yeah. i mean that's really the basics approach to it uh yeah you don't want to do what the soldier says and just get the ball and throw it at the rim that i mean that might go in occasionally but not not very often uh giddy witties for maryland uh let's see um, UAA11 asks, who do you think is the best ball handler in the NBA? Again, that's a tough question. I mean, I, probably somebody like Kyrie Irving or something like yeah, that. There are a lot of them that are really good. And some are better in certain situations than others and vice versa. Yeah. You know, you, you have to look at Curry and understand he has great ball skills, uh, but he doesn't use them quite the same way as Irving does. Irving is trying to break you down and get to the basket. Um, whereas Curry is trying to maneuver you and get you in a position where he can shoot over you. Right. Okay. Crazy fast two three five one asks, how do I become a LeBron James type player? <laughs> well, I mean, LeBron James. That's that's interesting because LeBron James is is probably a, he's a freak of nature when it comes to his athleticism and his body and things like that. Uh, but he also he's one of those guys that can do a lot of everything. Yes. And do it well. And so what we say is, is is even taking the LeBron James thing out of it is that you want to become a great all-around versatile player and be able to post up, be able to to go on the perimeter, be able to make free throws, be able to play defense, be able to uh, you know contest shots, be able to fill in the blank, do all of that stuff because that's going to make you a valuable player no matter where you play. Yeah. 
You know, the coach might say, hey, I want you to play shooting guard. Or they might say, hey, I want you to play power forward or whatever it is. Be prepared to play all those spots. LeBron James is a very good example of that. He can do pretty much everything on the court. Yeah. Uh, you know, he may not he might not be the best three point shooter, but he can shoot a three pointer. He can also go in and he can slash and he can play uh, with his back to the basket. He can also, you know, play defense. Uh, so, you know, you have to be able to play a, a versatile approach to the game and you will be in good shape. Um, the soldiers ask, how do you become the best player in the world? Well, that takes a lot of work and a lot of luck and and good luck. <laughs> um, let's see. Um Robert Stark asks, how can I make myself show out more because I've been scoring the most in games, but my team's been losing. How do you handle being a good player on a bad team? You just got to keep playing, creating opportunities for yourself and for your team. Yep. And, you know, sometimes you're just going to be on a team where you're not going to get the win all the time. Exactly. And it can be frustrating, but you play through it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Cristiano Solano is asking, Coach, should I square up or tilt tilt my body to the basket? Like we said a little bit earlier, always want to have that slight stagger to your shooting side. Right. Shooting a basketball is a basically a one-handed uh, event. It is. Uh, you know, if you take that assist hand off, you can shoot with just your your shooting arm, and that's essentially what your shot is. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, Detacit Ronan says, how do you practice your handles? I can't practice outside for some reason, so any tips? I mean, well, that's another figure it out situation. It, it is, it is. And and we can't do that for you, unfortunately. Well, well we, can, we can tell you what the drills are, and you can go oh, to yeah. our, our channel and check out all of our, our ball handling yeah. drills. And, you know, maybe you need to find a, a open garage that you can yeah. go in and, and chill in. Garages work great. Or you can ask your mom politely if you can use the kitchen or whatever it is. I mean, you have to figure that one out because yeah. there is a ton of drills that you can do you just have to really get uh spend the time is really what it is okay we're going to answer two more questions and then we're out of here uh okay I'll, we have uh javier cody board is from new york uh let's see uaa 11 is from pennsylvania cool um let's see two more questions um Double B FIFA Pro Club says, how can I be a better role player on my team? I mostly play the last minutes in the second quarter and I'm having trouble being cold off the bench. Well, and that's that's a tough situation yeah, when you is. come off the bench. You just have to be prepared to get out there and play. You can't force anything to happen. You just have to do what you can. Uh, I think that there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of step out of just being a role player. Uh, where you know you are developing your all-around game like we talk about and you're doing all the things from how to make the team as just how you approach playing in general yeah. where you're showing initiative you're showing effort uh, you're showing leadership skills and you know if you if you want to be in the game sit next to the coach on the bench yeah so that when they look down the the, the bench trying yeah. to see what their options are that you're the first one there and you're yeah. in the game yeah. you're watching what's going on you know what you need to do when you step into each position now, um, being cold off the bench uh just a quick address on that one go for it usually uh within just uh, uh, a half a minute or so you're up and down your heart's beating fast and you're starting to sweat a little bit and now you're starting to get into the flow of the game so i don't think that's that is something that is holding you back uh because usually we tend to get in the flow right away right um let's see last question here um uh, let's see we got to make it somewhat of a good one <laughs> um okay let's do this one from uaa 11 because it's about shooting we are shot science we'll we'll answer this one as our last one this one is uh or they ask how can i become better at mid-range shots and free throws you know we have a drill that we call the form shooting drill and uh if you take and utilize go to our, our youtube channel and you'll find it there and what we do there is encourage you to develop good shot mechanics and all of them are short distance we start at the blocks and then we move up to the first peg and then into the middle at about 11 feet that's where we start but then you can make that that grow a little bit further by stepping out away from the block maybe one step and going to the second peg and then to the free throw line as you're working on those stroke mechanics. And the stroke mechanics uh, are the key to it. And once you get those down, you'll find that 
and you, you, you don't take an easy way out. On that particular drill, we tell you this, make 10 perfect shots, uh, as perfect as you can make before you go to the next one. And the reason for that is we want you to establish strong muscle memory for shooting correctly. And once you've got that correctness in there, you're going to find the shot start to fall for you pretty, uh, pretty effectively. Yeah, it's about progressing slowly back without yeah. losing any of your mechanics. Exactly. Because exactly. if you're if you're going from two feet to twenty feet, things are going to break down. Yeah. So you want to progress back, master that close in, take a step back, master that, take a step back, master that, and you'll find that all the muscle memory and the power generation, all that will be there yeah. as you do that. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to free throws, free throws, you know, here most people when they practice free throws, they'll do it at the very beginning of practice. Yeah. They'll come in and they'll shoot it as like a warm up or whatever. Uh, we always say that you should be practicing free throws throughout your different fatigue levels during practice. Right. So if you are, uh, you know, shooting every, you know, 15, 20 minutes of your practice, you're going in there and you're doing some free throws, you're going to find that when you get into an actual game and you're in deep in the fourth quarter and you're trying to make those free throws that you've actually been there before in practice yeah. where you were tired and you were fatigued and, and you weren't mentally where you're just super fresh and you'll be able to make those shots. Whereas right. if you're trying to make it and you've only practiced while you're fresh, good luck because yeah. that that's that's hard you've never you're, you're using your body in a situation that you've never used it in before right. okay so i think that's it for it today you guys thanks so much for all the questions if we didn't answer answer your question it's not because we don't like you it's because we ran out of time uh if you want to talk to us during the week and you know we'd love to have you join the team make sure you follow us on all our social media stuff we are shot signs and everything so we're on facebook google plus uh twitter instagram snapchat all those places just look for us we are shot science and we do different things on all those different places and we would love to have you uh i guess we will see you guys next time sunday 1 p.m pacific time uh thanks so much thanks guys see you later